mountains, valleys, volcanoes, trenches. Our Earth is covered in surface features. It's not a perfect sphere. The Earth is alive. And I'm not talking about the animals or the people or the plants on the surface of the Earth. I'm talking about the planet itself. As an astronomer who studies planets outside of our solar system and who lives on a planet with such rich surface features, I naturally ask myself one question. Is it possible to find these features on exoplanets? That was the question I wanted to answer. How could we find these features on other planets? Astronomers struggle to study the atmospheres of planets outside of our solar system. And so it seems kind of unreasonable to expect that we could actually study mountains on the surfaces of these planets. On the other hand, when you stand next to a mountain, you're completely overwhelmed by its size. I mean, we can actually see mountain ranges from space. Why wouldn't we be able to study them on planets outside of our solar system? Is it possible to find these features on exoplanets? And when I thought about how to actually solve it, the first place I thought to look was in a planet's transit light curve. Typically, when we study a planet's light curve, we assume the planet is perfectly spherical, and that produces a really simple trapezoid-shaped light curve with a flat bottom. And the depth of that light curve depends on the ratio of the planet's area to the star's area. Our method depends on assuming the planet isn't spherical. We assume that it has all of these weird shapes jutting out from the planet's surface. And those shapes will actually change the silhouette of the planet. It will change the area of the planet. That means it will change the depth of the transit. My research goal last year was to be able to go from a transit light curve without a flat bottom, a transit light curve that has changes in its transit depth to a measure of how mountainous a planet is. Using elevation data from the rocky bodies in our solar system, I was able to quantify how mountainous or bumpy those planets were. Bumpiness is kind of a new thing in astronomy, so I had to come up with its definition. After trying out a few different definitions that didn't really work out, I settled on this. The bumpiness of a planet is the standard deviation of all of the radial distances from the center of the planet to the surface across the entire surface of the planet. If you don't know what standard deviation is, that's totally okay. Just remember that the bumpiness of a planet is a measure of how much the average feature on a planet sticks out from its surface. Once I had the bumpiness values for all of these rocky planets, the next step was to simulate their transits so that I could know what their light curves look like. From these light curves, I was able to measure how much the transit depths varied. The third step was to actually fit a line between the bumpiness and the variation in the transit depth, which I call scatter. And the equation for this line was the big result of the paper. It was an equation that people can actually use to go from an observed light curve to a measure of how bumpy the planet that created that light curve is. So maybe now is the time to tell you that using this method, we can't actually find individual mountains on exoplanets. Instead, what we can do is get an idea of how bumpy on average a planet is. I'm sure at this point you're probably wondering, how feasible is this method? My advisor and I spent a lot of time figuring out how difficult it would be to detect mountains using different types of telescopes. What we discovered was that the ideal case for discovering mountains would be a Mars-type planet orbiting a white dwarf star. That's the ideal case because the star isn't too much bigger than the planet, and that means all of the features in the transit light curve are going to be really exaggerated. Given the ideal case of a Mars-type planet transiting in front of a white dwarf star, we determined that it'd actually be possible to detect bumpiness with confidence in just 20 hours using the overwhelmingly large telescope. In case you haven't seen the video on giant telescopes, the overwhelmingly large telescope, or OWL for short, is going to have a diameter of 100 meters across. If we use a smaller telescope than the OWL, then it would take more time to detect bumpiness. But if these types of systems are more common than we think they are, then it would take less time to detect bumpiness. Okay, so I've explained to you how we think we can find bumpiness, and I've told you that it's actually possible to do so. 
But why are we interested in finding mountains on exoplanets in the first place? Aside from the fact that it'd be really cool to find the first mountain outside of our solar system. Mountains themselves aren't directly related to habitability, but they are related to other characteristics of a planet that do influence whether or not life can form there. For example, we've established that the creation of mountains depends on the movement of tectonic plates and having internal volcanism. Tectonic plates are helpful for life because they help to cycle harmful carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and into the interior of the planet. Internal volcanism is helpful for life because it provides another source of heat. This is especially helpful if a planet happens to lie on the outer edge of its star's habitable zone. Studying mountains on exoplanets can also help us learn about the presence or absence of oceans and atmospheres, and it can help us learn about the rotation periods of planets. It can actually help us figure out how long a day is on a planet millions of light years away. This was my first big research project and led to my first published scientific article. This project was really exciting to me because I got to build the field of exotopography from the ground up. When I came across a problem that I didn't know how to solve, the chances were pretty high that no one else had solved that problem either. There's a lot more work to be done on this project and I'm really looking forward to doing that, but if you want to stay updated on news about this and other really cool astronomy research going on, then be sure to subscribe to the Cool Worlds YouTube channel. And I'll see you next time.